Welcome to Barrels and Burbs with hosts John Ingle and Roberto Cabrera. Over the next hour, you're going to learn some insider knowledge that will help you overcome and strategize in the cutthroat world of real estate. Now, here are your hosts, John and Roberto. Welcome, everybody. Burrs and Burbs, episode 110, commercial real estate. I am so excited. We have small shows. We have big shows. This is destined to be one of the big shows. There's a lot of interest right now in commercial real estate and how it's affecting uh, the national economy. Uh, Barry Sternlich was on yesterday on a panel with The Real Deal, and he said he sees the economy. He was n- nothing but bullish about the American economy and real estate specifically, with the exception of commercial real estate. And so it's capturing the headlines. Uh, everybody's talking about it. We've got some big, we've got some big names in the industry. We've got Vincent Santoro, who runs a uh, commercial for Douglas Elliman in New York. We've got Jason Froelich in our Beverly Hills office, uh, LA. And we've got Jonathan Miller, and everybody um, is probably familiar who's uh, who's uh, familiar with this show is familiar with Jonathan Miller because this is, I think, your third time with us. In the last only book. amateurs count, John. So only so amateurs before, count. Before I begin, uh, you can find us on Voice America. That's uh, that, that's a a screen grab of where you can find us, and you can find the entire catalog at VoiceAmerica.com. I want to thank our sponsor, Grace Farms. You'll find them at Grace uh, sharegracefarms.com, where you can buy their uh, teas and coffees and do in and support their causes uh, by giving these to your clients. There's Jason. You'll find him. That's Jason in uh, our Beverly Hills office. There's Vincent. You can find him in our New York office. And there's Jonathan Miller at Miller Samuel. And I want to bring a, a one more plug to his housing notes, which come out every Friday. It's a must read. Lots of good charts, economic information, uh, including on commercial. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to my partner, uh, Roberto Cabrera at our Upper West Side New York headquarters. What do you think about today's show, Roberto? I think it's extremely important. It's the, it's the one like cloud hanging over everything uh out there in my opinion um so you know and everybody is has a doom and gloom but then some people see some optimism towards the end of 2024 um i'm i want to hear what everybody has to say because i really don't know i don't know how some of these places are going to set are going to survive in new york do you see a percept uh large vacancy in the commercial sector you're not in the commercial sector. You sell residential. But are your clients talking about the commercial sector? And are you seeing vacancy? And is there, so when you talk about a cloud or a gloom, is it's it just from me or is it something belief. you read that's, about in the Times? It's, some, it's, it's what I read about, et cetera. It's not coming from my clients whatsoever. My clients are very siloed in their residential, you know, spaces. Um, but everything I read and I, you know, I watch a lot of Squawk Box and I do a lot of reading and no one's, I mean, there's a, there is a consensus that it's a very big problem. And primarily it's because of the commercial real estate loans that are coming due. Uh, what are we going to do about them? What's that going to do to value? And a lot of these places, they don't want to, they don't want to sell these assets because they're going to mark the, you know, they're going to mark a comparable that could be a domino effect for all the others. So they're really trying, they're just trying to write all this stuff down. So, but how long can they hold that? How much cash do they have? You know? All right. 70% of these loans are being held by the regional banks. So I don't think their pockets are as deep as, you know, the bigger institutions, which really aren't touching it. All right, Jonathan, why don't you, why don't you help us out? Why don't you set the table? Should we be talking about commercial real estate on a city by city basis? Should we be talking about it on a sector by sector, splitting office apart from, say, industrial or retail? How should we be thinking about commercial before we go to our experts and start posing hard questions? Yeah, so I I, I think that um, commercial real estate is uh, probably should be and retail should be treated 
separately uh, or thought about separately and not sort of stereotyping all of commercial. Um, the reality, at least in, in my opinion, is that uh, work from home has changed everything. And, uh, and so as a result, you're having, you know, uh, companies with lots of empty space and uh, they can't, they can't lease spaces at the market rate because then they can't make their debt service uh, on the building. And so I think what you're going to see um, over the next, I think this is a, I think in many ways, this is, I don't want to say siloed from the rest of real estate, but this is not going to cause some sort of you know, financial crisis like we had with uh, residential, you know, back 15 years ago. I think this is much more isolated. The reality is, I the only way I see this sort of moving forward um, is uh, a lot of these assets, and we're already seeing it now, are moving from weak hands to stronger hands. And when they move to stronger hands, they can offer leasing prices at market rates, and then you're going to have a tremendous inbound migration of companies and individuals that were priced out of the office market. Um, the story is really about class B and C and maybe the lower end of class A, like the upper end of class A is like, you know, the luxury high end is, is not and you know, nearly under the same sort of risk as the rest of the market. So I guess we have to hand the ball to either Jason or Vincent, whoever wants to tackle this. But is the reason that Jonathan says we're not going to see a crisis is that we're going to repurpose that real estate. We're going to rezone it. We're going to repurpose it. And we're going to rebalance the market. I'm going to so jump in so, because we're an office dense vertical market here. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Right. In order to comply for residential occupancy, your floor, the commercial floor plates are too deep. Windows don't open. Um, there's the need to pierce the slab throughout to add bathrooms, stacks, risers. Uh, I think what's going to happen, and probably to most of these VNC buildings, is uh, they will the lots will get repurposed. The buildings will get torn down and reconstructed uh, as proper residential buildings. And uh, the city needs it desperately at, at all price points, but for sure in that middle income price range. Uh, it's interesting. I have a son who is a middle income price ranger who has, I, I suggested to him that he throw his name into the lottery for um, New York City middle income housing, right? You, there's a cap on the on the income limit. And he is, he'll get called to a building and he'll be number 1100 for seven units. So how do you like that? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so he's a market rent payer right now and very unhappy about it because it eats up a huge amount of his discretionary income. But um, yeah, that, that's the office sector, right? And you really need to look at this as there's the, the small mixed use building, that's commercial. Anything five residential units or over, that's commercial. Uh, freestanding retail is commercial, pad sites are commercial, all of these different pieces of the puzzle, industrial, storage, um, some parts of the market are thriving, right? And will continue to thrive and continue to grow. And in certain neighborhoods, like uh, the Upper West Side near this office, where there is um, residential density, there's not a lot of empty retail. And same, I live in Brooklyn Heights, same thing along Port Street, Atlantic Avenue, something closes and something else reopens. But what we are seeing is that if a dress shop or a shoe store closes, another one doesn't open. It'll be a butcher. It'll be one of the education vendors, right? Uh, uh, tutor time or something like that. It'll be coffee, dry cleaning, uh, some kind of service, grocery, food. That's what's reopening in the retail, repopulating the retail, which sort of makes for eh, an interesting mix, right? Some, some small players who had the dream and maybe left their corporate job have the opportunity now because retail rents have come down. But um, that's really kind of thriving depending on where you look. And then you go in that Madison Avenue corridor, that north of $1,500 a foot corridor, and it's pretty empty. So that, that's how we look. How do you look out there, Jason? You know, it's really interesting. I think that uh, Jonathan touched on something that's, I think, very key and pivotal for what we're talking about here is that all commercial is not created equal. 
the um, the office market is what seems to be taking the biggest hit right now. Um, still recovering, of course, from from COVID, and uh, you know the retail sector. You know, from what from what I'm seeing, I mean, I I, I don't want to say that I'm I'm in a bubble, but I'm I'm in Los Angeles. I'm in the greater Los Angeles area, working on deals from San Diego up to San Francisco, and you know we are you know, not, I won't say unlike New York, but we are very much an entertainment industry driven economy. And we have only one half of those two segments still on strike. Okay. And entertainment deals, which were a, have been a driving force in the Los Angeles market have all but ceased. Now the money is still there, but the optics of doing a deal or not they can't do anything right now because it's it went from being a situation where hey you know you know disney just whatever whatever it being a a a great storyline to like oh my god can you believe disney just did whatever it the optics are just they're starving actors out there who are out of work and so and so can't do a deal so um, I've been doing this long enough. I've seen a few of these entertainment strikes and I know what happens, you know, and if history repeats itself, which, you know, from everything I remember, it does, is that, you know, once the strike is over, once the, inter- once the actor strike is over, at least until the next one, there's going to be, you know, every, it's like the deer in headlights. Um, you know, there's certain segments of the market that are still just unbelievable. I mean, I just listed a trophy property on, on the street that GQ magazine called the, you know, the coolest block in America called Abbott Kinney in, in Venice. If some of you are aware of that, I just listed a property that, you know, 3,500 a square foot on a retail space. It's a hundred percent leased where people are paying between 20, you know, you guys do it differently in, in Los Angeles. We do things by square foot per month, not annualized. So $20 a foot, you know, is the equivalent of $240 a foot, if you can imagine. So $240 a foot on a triple net basis. And I've got a waiting list of tenants wanting to get into these buildings. Now juxtaposition that to a a class A office building where there's vacancy, it it doesn't register. Standalone office buildings where there's more open space versus smaller spaces are in very high demand right now, incredible high demand. But I think it's real important that we all understand that while there is a real issue that 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 you all touched on, uh, you know, with the loans and notes coming due, is you know, we work, we all work in luxury markets, and this is a very micro market driven economy. What happens in Fresno is not what's going on in Los Angeles. What's happening in Pittsburgh is not what's happening in New York City. What's happening in one borough is not the same as what's happening in another. What's happening in Los Angeles is not what's happening in San Diego. What's happening in medical is not what's happening in retail it's very micro market and when you lump commercial as a whole it, it you know it, it 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 kind of skews the perspective i don't know does that no that's totally fair i mean what's happening in san francisco for example feels a million miles away from us in new york we're like well that's a tech sector problem and that's unique problems to san francisco you know that's not going to affect us i think everybody is affected by the commercial real estate loans turning over i have a quote on the screen that said uh that 20 billion of office commercial mortgage backed securities which bundle together individual loans mature in 2023 uh, according to real estate provider TREP, uh, that that's a Reuters story. So, but I thought twenty billion. That, yeah, that's that not that sound that's, like that much. Yeah, that seems a little low. Yeah, um, it's how big is how big half. is the problem? It's pretty big. I'll tell you where I'm sitting. 
for the first time in the history of record keeping, there's more sublet space available on the mar office market than there is direct landlord space. That's a huge problem, right? People are holding the bag on leases that they're going to default on, which is gonna force litigation, gonna force the landlord to default on a loan. It's gonna be pretty ugly. Uh, and I'm kind of surprised, Jonathan, why aren't you seeing that this has happened sooner than later? <laughs> well, the um, it's interesting because like what Jason was saying, I'm, you know, I because there's so many comparisons of San Francisco made to New York, and the vacancy rate in San Francisco for commercial office is like 34%, which is like 10% more than uh, Manhattan is right now. Um, it's a huge number. And you think, okay, so it's the tech sector, um, but it's really work from home. Um, you know, that's the that's the big issue is work from home and fundamentally changing commercial office. So yes, there's niche, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you, you can't label an entire market the same and it's not, but, um, but actual just bread and butter. Um, we've, we're, we're overbuilt for bread and butter office, not niche, um, but just generic sort of big office buildings. And you're seeing, you know, every day, uh, stories about, you know, landlords walking away, you know, leaving the keys, uh, Blackstone just did something on the West coast. You're, you're seeing a lot of this activity and it's, it's accelerating. And, um, and the reason is because the leases don't support the debt service. And, and so the, so when you think about how this plays out going forward, um, what do you see in the future that's going to make office leases rise? And for the life of me, at least in the near term over the next four or five years, I can't think of a thing. Um, well, it's just scarcity. And how, how does that happen? Buildings get taken out, out of inventory by being torn down and repurposed, yeah, right? Exactly. Or that trickle of, of... And that takes time, right? That's products. not going to happen in six right. months. That's a 10-year minimum, right? Maybe 20. Right. And you also have... The thing is, um, and I'm not being... You know, I'm not trying not to be doom and gloom and, and all that. But, you know, think about... There's a lot of landlords here that you know, say half of the the tenants they have signed deals before the pandemic. So they're not feeling the full force of, uh, you know, a much lower rent roll, right? That, like the, So that's why I look at this as a five-year window. It's not like sort of one and done. It's, it's, it's just going to play out for a while. And frankly, I don't think anybody really knows how this is going to play out. It's sort of like falling down in slow motion. I'm very optimistic about the recovery of office once the um, the pricing, uh, repricing is enabled by, um, you know, uh, current, many current developers going, you know, losing or walking away from um, or getting rid of the debt service that they have because of, you know, a distressed situation. So New York reached, Mayor Adams said that New York reached an equal employment to what it was pre-pandemic for the first time. So we're at a, essentially, let's just say that's 100%. But office, you're saying is 25% vacancy. So 100% came back, but only, only got the 75%. Uh, right, right. And well, also too, like, and if you, it's a little controversial, but if you follow the uh, castle data on security card swipes, um, New York City is stuck at 50%. Yeah, it's um, 75% is leased. Uh, it ain't getting used. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Like, and you how, know, does, they, how does how do those swipes compare, though, to pre-pandemics? I'm sure, I'm sure it wasn't 100%. Was it well, it's so funny because I actually wrote about this a while ago in my newsletter. Um, yeah, so 49, 8.8. You know, it's sort of stuck. It's straddling 50%. But that is assuming that pre-pandemic was 100%. So when it says 50%, it really is more like 45 or, or 40 because occupancy, you know, it, it, those kind of numbers have never existed. Um, so the, the math is sort of, you know, twisted. Um, but it, but it, 
you know, the concern is that, you know, we're just not, I can't tell you how many meetings, I do a lot of litigation, like testimony, depositions, and I go into these huge law firms, and literally there's like five people there, um, but they have beautiful built out, huge space, you know, probably 100, you know, 100, 150 employees. And there's like three people there on a Wednesday after. And their revenue probably hasn't changed dramatically. They're just no space that's not being used, right? It's not so what we want to know is, but... are they giving up that space? Are they repurposing that building? I can't imagine. No, I don't think so. No, they're not going to. In, they're not. I, they're gonna. They're gonna. They'll, I think you know Vincent's point was uh, was you know spot on about you know, sort of buildings on the margin, you know, the B's and C's, they're gonna, they, they're they gonna they going to be repurposed by either converting or starting over, but only until, only after, you know, the, the landlord has a financial moment, right? Where the building gets taken over. Like no one, no one is gonna say, hey, I've got this building at this location uh, you know, an existing landlord's had a building for 40 years. They're going to say, hey, I'm going to tear it down. Now, someone's going to, you know, have to to take it over, buy it or whatever. Um, I found this when looking for new office. I'm in Class B. I looked at lots of lots of Class B in Midtown. And the landlords knew what the market was, but they couldn't go down to it because they couldn't make their debt service. Like, I, I was struck by... That was a dominating sort of factor in the you know the current market or with it over the last year or so. So, Jonathan, you say you had said you know it's going to the asset's going to go from a smaller party to a larger party who can handle it. But yeah, that, or a stronger you know, party, you know, sure. someone but with that, the money. But that transition comes at a marked price, correct? Correct. So, therefore, the only way out is to see these prices. Just you're going to. When do the dominoes start to fall? We keep saying, we keep hearing, and I keep everywhere I read, it's like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. You know, I think it's already, it, I th it just, just read the real deal. Every day, there's someone turning the keys in. Uh, there's some landlord going out. It's happening right now. And it's happening, you know, every day. Um, and I, I just think it's a gradual process. It, you know, it's it's going to correct or fix itself. I'm very optimistic about the city. Um, it just a lot of this stuff is uh, just needs to move from weak to stronger hands, and that's going to, you know, happen when banks take action on you know properties that are not performing. Um, I, I just is think Jason, I, Vincent, I think it's already Vincent happening. Talked about deer in the headlights, and I can't think of it. Our, but at a certain point, there's impact. When, when is that Our, first, one of those first banks going to take that action? Let me consult my uh, my 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 magic eight ball and I'll let you know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, quite frankly, I think that that, that con, you know, pessimist. Listen, we, you can't you can't uh, you can't deny and avoid the inevitable and, and, and the, the elephant in the room. You know, there is there there is an interest rate problem. There is a financing right. problem. There are landlords that are incredibly solvent that have the staying power. And, you know, the one thing that, you, you know, that, that Jonathan mentioned, you know, Blackstone, uh, you know, giving back the keys, it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a large product in, in my market in an area called Playa del Rey. Okay. Or Playa Vista, if you will, which is in Playa del Rey. And it's a class A office building and primarily, you know, tech and entertainment industry driven and I represent a tremendous amount of entertainment and what I'm seeing and what, I, what we're experiencing is that obviously during COVID, you know, they, they farmed everything out and the creatives are now working from home and they don't need this in office space. But what the conversation is turning to is great. Once they have a, you know, we're talking about the employees and the need for, you know, for, for space, if you will, once they have a project, Great. Send them off on their own. Let them go be creative. But the creative juices flow when people are together. And when people are together in a collective group, in an office setting, 
where I'm seeing, you know, uh, quite a number of my clients are requiring their, 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 um, their employees, if you will, even if they're independent contractors to come into the office three to four days per week and then go do what you want the rest of the time because they realize that the ideas come from a collective and then they can go and do their own thing. So when you talk about not giving back this office, you go into, you know, 150, you know, person office space and five or six people being there, that might be on the days that you're there, but I guarantee you on two or three days a week, those offices are pretty full, you know, or at least that's what I'm seeing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a, I think that's a really good point. Um, listen, I'm not saying that, you know, there's no need for offices. I think what I'm saying is we're going to probably center at three days a week um, as an average across all industries. Some are, some industries are more collaborative. Some are not. Um, some leadership is very, you know, old school five days a week. Um, some are not. Um, but it's, it's not going to be four and a half days a week. It's going to be three days a week. And, you know, uh, and maybe now it's, I'm making this up, it's two and a half, it's less, you know, it's less than it ultimately will stabilize at. But the reality is, if you needed uh, 100,000 square feet, and now you're three days a week, well, now you really only need 60,000 square no. feet. And so the other 30,000, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to sublet, right? And and that's kind of the math, um, I think. According uh, to your charts, everybody shows up Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Well, so but, you still need a hundred thousand feet. <laughs> there are companies that are operating like co-working space, where and even if you're a full-time employee, the the receptionist gets a desk, the officers get desks and offices, everyone else gets a laptop, and when they come in, they plug into whatever's empty. And that creates a far more efficient floor plate and use of the space for sure. Uh, I don't know if that's going to become uh, adopted across more industries. I I'm speaking specifically of the consulting business where a friend of mine is a partner, large company. And it's pretty amazing that, you know, before he was a partner, he'd walk in with his laptop, seven figure a year guy and would sit down at a desk, whatever was empty. Yeah. So I'm hearing long, long term and very gradual because interest rates are moving long term and planning and zoning boards take a long time to uh, say re <laughs> rezone the Brooklyn waterfront from industrial uh, to what it is now residential that took a it took forever. And everybody knew it was a good idea. And still it took forever. And that's happening in every small town in America, I sit on the planning and zoning board in my town, and we struggle with giving up our our cute downtown shopping district. We struggle with losing the retail core. And likewise, we're having a tough time uh, accepting change in the office in the office. We're having trouble uh, reevaluating the need for parking all of these things. So even if the money sorts itself out and the back to work sorts itself out, we still have zoning boards and municipal governments that are taking a long time to adapt to change. Yes. Have yes. you seen any success stories where municipal governments, and I might say South Florida is one of the more progressive at trying to figure out how to um, build the infrastructure, uh, that goes along with the new uh, the, the new building, uh, building schools as fast as they can, building housing as fast as they can. They seem to get it. They're not standing in the way of progress. And well, why, Florida, do think, why do you think uh, that, John? I, I think that because Florida is seeing uh, population growth like nobody else and they're adapting, they're changing. You know, you're starting to see, OK, let's, uh, you know, if Palm Beach is oversold and expensive, let's look at West Palm Beach. Let's start building schools there as fast as we can, and let's allow towers to go up. 
for the very first time in West Palm Beach. And they're going yep. and guys like Ross are coming from New York, heading down to West Palm Beach and buying every bit of, of square feet that they can, knowing that Florida is a good partner for them. I don't know if Mr. Ross thinks that New York or L.A. is as good a partner for him. So that's part of the effort. One thing is economic. Second is back to work. And where do you think the occupancy rate will be? But the third is you need to have a good partner in the municipality. Well, I, I noticed um, I uh, I do go down to Florida. I cover about 25 housing markets for Element in Florida. And they're having a, there's a lot of new class A commercial office space that's being constructed right now because they see Florida is undergoing this restructuring, not only in the residential, but also in the commercial market. So you have Stephen Ross and different people that are getting bullish on uh, office development, um, even though they still have some of the cha same challenges with work from home. But they're, what I noticed in Florida, a lot of the municipalities have uh, sustainability directors, and it's not environmental. It's... Uh, specific departments that are focused on attracting CEOs to move to Florida and bring their companies with them. And they've been, you know, quasi successful with securities um, and biotech and a couple of other uh, industries. Like there, there's a focus on trying to sort of, you know, not start over, but like, you know, take it a step further than it has. And, um, and that's, you know, that gives them a competitive advantage. Um, you know, uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, and, and I think this was brought up by uh, Jason earlier, like every market is different and every subset is different. And one thing that is happening in Florida is that commercial office is we're seeing growth. Um, we're seeing sort of optimism about the future which is, is not new what we're york seeing. is la learning anything from florida learning anything from austin texas and dallas vincent are they, are we learning anything we learned something when 9 11 happened and we had to rebuild southern the lower end of manhattan uh, uh, yeah too much office square footage right i mean but, but <laughs> our, our, our 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 execution lagged behind the market exponentially right yeah so it may be the lesson we learned is to move faster right yeah. Are we capable in New York of moving faster? TBD. Um, I hate this idea of a slow drip. I hate all this, you know, slow uh, and gradual that Jonathan Miller is talking about. You know, the good news is that when it happens, the development community rallies and it happens. Yeah. Like the Gowanus Brooklyn, that canal got dredged, uh, got a new seawall, got some uh, federal government uh, super fun cleanup. And there are, there, there could be close to 20 new sizable residential mixed use construction sites there now that are in full swing. Um, I used to walk that way to go to manage one of the offices in, in Park Slope. And um, it was always two, one or two story warehouse and industrial. Now they're, they're gone and there are acres and acres of developments going on there. And it's just, it was shocking for somebody who lives less than a mile away. I had no idea the extent. Uh, you know, um, uh, if I can add something that both Vincent and John brought up, John brought up early on the um, the possible repurposing of some of these commercial buildings. And then you talked a little bit about some you know, of the, you know, how Florida is being a little bit more proactive. Here's part of what the issue is. The developers are in it for profit. OK, They're, the the profit comes from sell, you know, from converting some of these to high end luxury whether they're condos or high-end rentals and the bureaucracies, the, the boards, John, like some that perhaps you're sitting on, those aren't where the needs are. Those are where the wants are. The needs are for affordable housing. Yeah. The needs are for more, I, I mean, affordable is of course <laughs> very relative depending on where you live, you know? Yeah. And, you know, until there's a, for me, for what I see, until there's, there's a big delta from where a profit can be made from converting, you know, a, a class A building, you know, regardless of what the obstacles are, but just 
rezoning, if you will, uh, until there's some form of, you know, how to how to make up the delta from the profit. You're not going to see develop the developers want to, you know, repurpose them to, to luxury high end condos and sell for multi millions of dollars when that's not what the community wants or 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 or, or I won't say not what the communities need, if that makes sense. Right. And it, and the problem or the challenge of converting maybe, you know, obsolete office buildings um, is that the conversion cost itself, especially in New York, to go, you know, to convert the C, C of O um, to uh, residential is most developers that I've interacted with or read about uh, say that's the non-starter to begin with because it's it's not practical like they uh because even if the product they're creating is luxury um it's still not practical unless you can find a unique situation um you know it, it seems perfect we've got like an affordable housing shortage affordable meaning middle class like the workers um having a place to live to to live in the place that they work um you know, you you know, just that alone, that conversion is is problematic, um, and and that's the ch that's the challenge um, uh, in making the numbers work. I mean, developers developers are in it for the economic return, you know, the risk reward, and in most of the cases, converting a building takes much longer than a new build. I will tell you that I, I have an anecdote. I have a case study of that. There was, there's a New York developer. He had built, um, he had converted uh, dormitory housing into apartments in, in New York. He came out here and he said, you got to find me something in Fairfield County. I want to be in one of those communities that has good schools. Can you find me something that is approved, already approved by P and Z? And I said, it doesn't really work that way. But I said, he, I said, what do you, what do you want? Well, I'd like a hundred thousand square foot building. Well, first of all, we don't have those in the suburbs. So I have a couple of 20,000 square foot buildings, but that's about as good as it gets. We found him one for $6 million. And he said, okay, I can convert this office building that is um, class C in downtown you know, New Canaan. It's a hundred year old building and hadn't been renovated in a while. And I'm going to build 24 apartments. You need, you need a bunch of them to be affordable? No problem. 20%, I can do it. And he showed up in front of P and Z and he asked for the proposal. Uh, he, he made his proposal and they said, basically, you're going to have to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars in engineering drawings and then we'll let you know. And I think he got discouraged by the process. He left New York because the bureaucracy in New York is such that he can't get his projects approved. He came out here and said, give me something approvable. Same thing. I thought I gave him something that was, should, was good for the community, good for him, good for affordable housing. And PNZ couldn't, it, it has not accepted that we're in a different environment and that we do have to rezone some of these buildings and some of these blocks. So that's a real case study. And he left and he hasn't been back since. I don't know if he's going to find more success in New York. But I will say that I follow your housing notes, Jonathan, and I've been watching what Queens rents have been doing. And Queens, North Queens rents are equal to Brooklyn, equal to Manhattan. So I know that when they knock down all those buildings on the Queen, Queens waterfront, they got expensive. Yeah. Yeah, they, they did. It's just one subway stop from Midtown. And they're not building enough affordable there, are they? It's a challenge. Yeah, yeah that's 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 the problem um i wish i wish there you know when i think of commercial uh you know i think most people think of office right but multifamily is you know a huge part of commercial and uh and we've been building a lot of commercial multifamily nationwide in fact you could argue we're overbuilding a little bit um in terms of uh, new construction but but actual commercial office is um, is the real issue in terms of um, the la the next you know five seven years um, of challenges. Uh, you know, basically, 
I I think that everybody on you know, speaking, you know, even though I don't know what I'm talking about, I bet you no one on this panel really has a solid idea in their head about what's going to transform over the next five or six years because it's unprecedented. It's never happened before. And um, and that's why I think this is a process as opposed to you know flipping a switch. Who's comfortable talking to me about cap rates? Talk to me <laughs> about the cap rates that your landlords want to either sell these buildings. What kind, I mean, are these cap rates reflecting the changing environment? I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, because I have this email I shared with all of you. And so I'm going to remind you that one of them said, uh, leased real estate can be a good proxy for fixed income, especially in net lease deals. They can net lease deals continue to attract investors looking for stable returns. So on the one hand, the cap rates are rising, uh, rising in the net lease deals when compared to uh, the stock market opportunities. We're also seeing that the bid ask spread is very large. Cap rate, single tenant deals are climbing. The net lease property sector coming off of a record sales in 2021 saw a slowdown in new deals and in the first half of 2023. So can somebody help me make sense of where cap rates are and where they're going? John Hannigan, if you want to add something to that, because I know you're out here in the suburbs, as, and we've talked about this as well. But anyone cap rates? Well, I saw charts that said they're at six percent, and that was still true in office sector as well. Well, if if I if I may, I want to give you. I, I love case studies, so I'm working on a deal right now where I'm going to read you a text that I got from a client of mine on a property where properties have historically been trading at between, and I sold this person a property for 9 million two years ago at a three and a half cap, okay? I mean, a ridiculously low cap, okay? Um, for those, you know, I, I like to just, some, not everybody fully understands what a cap rate is. So if I could just go back to kind of like 101 for just a second, the, the best way it was ever described to me was, basically taking a Polaroid snapshot of a property that sells, that transfers on day 365 of ownership. At the end of the year, at the end of that year, what is the actual rate of return based on an all cash purchase? Somebody puts up a million dollars and it's a five cap at the end of the year, it should be worth a million and 50 to them. Okay. So I sold this person, uh, you know, a property in the in the in the low three cap rate. He just sent me, Jason. Based on those numbers, I'm at a seven and a half to eight cap at closing. I just bought a T bill this morning for five point eight percent. Okay, now it's a reasonable argument. I you, you you can't argue with. I just bought a T bill for five point eight, but the reality is, is yeah, but you 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 can't it. it, it it's 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 short term. It, you know, I mean, if that's what you want to do, then great. You know, real estate is a long term hold. People don't go in. People don't invest in real estate. They don't you know, they don't do it for the you know, if they're buying on a cap rate on a net leased investment, they're not doing it for one, two or three. While that might be the exit, that's not what they go into it for. OK, it's a long term hold. So you know, bay at 5.8, you know, at seven and a half, eight percent. I mean, you've got to go so far inland. I mean, it's I, you know, I, I've got this deal that I've got I've got co-listed with with Peter Hernandez, who's the you know president of Douglas Elliman, and you know, Western region. I read him this text message because it's a co-listing that we've got, and he just started laughing. He's like, Well, where where are you gonna find this 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 property? So Cap rates are climbing. Buyers are demanding a higher cap rate, which means the property value does go down. Um, yeah. Right? Yep. Property values are going down, but because not fast enough. Not fast enough to reflect 
falling office rents. Is that true? Generally, I am overgeneralizing, but the market's lagging. Well, again, you're talking office rents versus a retail, a retail property. Like I've sold quite a bit of, you know, fast food places, which a client of mine likes to call recession proof, you know, during COVID they loved the Burger Kings and the Wendy's and the Del Tacos and Taco Bells that I sold them because that's the only place you can get good, fast, cheap food. And they've never missed a rental payment. Okay. So that sector is strong as can possibly be. Now you go to the restaurants like an IHOP or a Denny's or something like that, where they can't, they couldn't serve on the inside. Those cap rates were rising and the values of those properties were diminishing. Okay. So you can't, again, as we started at the beginning of this conversation, you can't really compare office cap rates. Office cap rates are now as high as can be. You know, you're seeing properties trading at, you know, very much below the value of what they, you know, people are losing money on what they actually traded for. On a, on in a different sector, it's not quite the same. You know, all as we started the conversation, all commercial properties are not created equal. Yep. So in 2009, the last time the world came to an end, vacant office space was worth zero dollars per square foot on the open market right if you had a 50 percent occupied building it was worth half what you paid for it just absolutely unbelievable because nobody saw an upside anywhere no one saw an increase in occupancy and nobody saw an increase in rents in the form of escalations in in, in a new rent and somehow we the pendulum swung the other way and I don't know how fast it happened statistically, Jonathan, or if you paid attention to it, but it did swing back, right? And, yeah. and, and offices did repopulate. And maybe it's great that there was no knee-jerk reaction that buildings started getting torn down or re repurposed because there was a, a real need. And for better or for worse, the vacant space was available to, to uh, absorb that, that demand. So no amount of real deal headlines of uh, Blackstone handing back keys and other big, big players handing back keys is going to cause us to go over a cliff. You're seeing a gradual wrecking. We're not seeing the kind of crisis we saw in the 09. No, the crisis in 09 was a banking crisis. Um, it was liquidity. It was a liquidity crisis and it was you know, a global credit crisis. But we have to refinance. We have to with housing as a, a lot of stuff this year at at at, at very yeah. high rates relative. So that's, that's don't we problem. have a crisis? We have a crisis. We yeah In well sectors. yeah we have lots of crises. Like that's that's a that's a fact of life. But um, but I I think it stays within the sector. Um, the lending standards uh for these office buildings were very strong um you know if it was done in the last five years credit conditions were tighter in the last five years in in banking in lending than they were in the preceding you know prior to the financial crisis the preceding three decades like you know we're we're not we're not tripping into a banking crisis which is what happened last time. I think it's very different. So is there a, all the, these B and C buildings, there is a bid then. Like it's not going to, the floor is not going to fall out. There's a bid out there. It's just a matter of. It, dep it depends on what they're, you know, how, you know, the, you know, the collateral and relationship to the debt, uh, like in terms of, I'm thinking in the context of, changing the use like converting with an existing owner not selling you know the 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 lender has to agree to the change you know it's a new product and then you refi the new you get finance of a new product at you know a much higher rate right so that's kind of what john was saying it's um you know it's it's a different calculus now that's why i think the answer is distressed john hannigan of... you're a commercial real estate in the suburbs that you're selling office buildings primarily are you finding that the that the spread is too great right now that owners are not taking into account the new environment they're asking too much yeah we're we're north of new york city westchester and fairfield county westchester new york fairfield county connecticut and yes when those interest rates uh rose it it essentially froze the sale market that uh 
owners said, I'm not going below X. And buyers were like, you have to go X minus and I'll buy, I'm ready. And the market is, is frozen. You know, we're yeah. marketing two buildings in New Canaan, uh, Connecticut, one of the suburbs in, in Fairfield County, uh, right across from the train station and a block from all these awesome, you know, shops and restaurants. And the cap rate is too low for investors. So the other aspect of purchasing is users who could come in and take that lower cap rate because essentially if it's a multi-tenanted building and these are multi-tenanted office buildings I'm speaking about, then they can pay rent essentially to themselves for a portion of the space they're occupying. And part of this is ego too, right? So, you know, a, an owner of a, a business that comes in that owns the buildings and the prestige and the community um, and that's essentially who we're looking for in this particular product. Um, just as an aside, we're seeing that Class B office market frozen, and here's why. $25 rents, half of that rent is uh, operating in taxes, and the cost to build the space out could be $80, $90, $100 a square foot. And the term of the leases are five years. So you do the math. You know, if an owner spends a hundred bucks and they're getting, let's say, twelve bit fifty back uh, after the operating and taxes are paid for, it doesn't work. So there is no leasing going on in these buildings, and they're not. A lot of them are not zoned for other uses such as residential. And these communities, just like you're speaking about, John, are very slow to adapt to change the use. So these buildings. Just in the last six months or so, we're seeing multiple buildings uh, being turned back to the lenders and they're they're sort of stuck. And lastly, uh, there's one lender in Westchester County, one landlord who's trying to turn the keys back to the lender. The lender will not accept them <laughs> and they shut off all services. So there's no toilet paper in the bathroom. They're not cleaning the bathroom. They're not cleaning the space. They're not cutting the lawn. And it's a, forgive me, but a shit show right now. Um, and the, the tenants are reaching out to the landlord who's saying, hey, I have nothing to do with it. And they're trying to find out who the lender is. It's a commercial mortgage-backed security and no one can find anybody. And, you know, these, there's, there's, it's a multiple multi-building portfolio and many tenants in there. So that's a dramatic example. Incredible. All right, we've got a few minutes left. Vince, you got any observations? You learning anything? One of my favorite things to say to an unrealistic seller was always, the market will set the price. And what John just described is a market setting a price that's completely unacceptable to a seller. And that's a stalemate, right? Yeah. Um, it, you have to really be dealing with someone who needs to sell to get them to come down to where the market is, or it's it's a loss of time. Those are my pearls. <laughs> oh, that's good. I mean, I think that if I'm a seller and I believe that this is a short term problem and my building doesn't resolve some of the, doesn't resemble some of those buildings uh, that have that, that are currently experiencing problems. I mean, if I have decent occupancy. Um, why would I uh, sell at a perceived loss? Now I think I can muddle my way through this. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of owners out there who think they can muddle their way through this. It depends on their debt service, right, um, and their uh, operating expenses. Vince, what's the mood in New York? You're doing a radio show every week. What's the mood on the commercial sector in New York? <laughs> Um, I'm not that schooled in the commercial sector, although I do have an appreciation for it. But I did want to ask Jonathan Miller a question based on what he said before. Uh, we talked about this actually on my show this week, you know, with regard to affordable housing. So if a lot of these older pre-war buildings cannot be gutted, so to speak, and converted to residential uh, use with ease because of plumbing, et cetera, the fact that there's lack of air uh, and, and um, uh, sunlight, for example, these sides are all blocked in. What do the what do the owners of these buildings do? You know, if they can't afford to keep the buildings occupied with business, 
they want to convert to rent, uh, residential, but can't. What do they do? And, and you, I think you suggested earlier, you know, uh, throw the buildings down and start all over again. And I think that's a lot of people's uh, opinions. But how feasible is that? Um, not it's not really feasible because chances are they have they have a lender behind them uh, who has to agree with a change. And, uh, you know, this is that's what makes this so difficult is uh, you have buildings that are underutilized and can't really be converted under the present ownership because of the the uh, the debt service that they they have um, and they can't refi they can't do anything um eventually you know they, they turn over the keys i mean it's it's that kind of stark reality i think for many of these uh office buildings one quick follow-up too on the the landmarks or the historic district you know uh implications that these buildings fall within that what do you do the yeah, same thing right they can't they be can't. torn down <laughs> Hire a better architect. All right, Roberto, we got about a minute left. I'm going to let you take us out, but I am going to remind everybody to like, follow, and share this if you like it. Uh, spread the word on Burrows and Burbs. Go ahead, Roberto. What'd you learn? Guys, today? thank you, thank you so much for everything. I mean, I was silent a lot because I'm learning so much uh, of you know to, the, the the sense of what's happening. But what it seems like is that we're going to have a little bit of a long, slow slog, but it's going to kind of work itself out. Um, and, um, you know, at least the residential sector is going to come back. <laughs> That's what I feel. But uh, um, I think it's going to take a while, it seems. Right, Jonathan? Yeah, I agree. Be patient. And it's a national problem. L.A. is, is going to feel it, and Vincent's going to feel it in New York. And I'm going to feel it here in New Canaan. <laughs> We're all in this together, guys. We are. Yes, we are. All right. Thank you very much. This Thanks, is a John. really good show. We're, I think we're going to have to revisit this. There's a lot more to unpack on commercial. Maybe we'll take take different niches or maybe we'll take it city by city. But thank you so much for uh, 